there's a school in Mexico City that's called the Benny Merito, and it was the I think as far as I'm concerned, it was the, like the number one high school in Mexico, or if not the number one, it's like the top five. It's amazing. Um, it's huge, and it's I mean if we think about our Provo MTC, it's way bigger than that. It's almost like BYU campus big, and, and people live there. Kids live there when they were going to high school, and teachers would live there, and it was a positive atmosphere. Um, really pretty. The grass is just greener than green, and um, the buildings are beautiful. Um, so that was called the Benny Merito. And then when I was in my mission, they told us that it was going to be changed to the M MTC, and it was amazing to see the uproar of happiness. It was just like everyone. I mean, there was some sadness that some kids were like, well, I want to go there. And what's, where am I going to go? A Catholic high school? or Because that's pretty much what there is. So their options kind of diminished. And, and non-members would go to that high school too. But, I mean, they'd get converted. They loved the atmosphere there. It was, it was like a high school BYU. Just every class, they'd start out with a prayer. And there was devotionals like every day. And so it was a great atmosphere. But the fact that it, now it's an MTC, people are just so happy thinking now missionary work is coming really hard towards mexico in that direction mexico city the heart of it is called a place called el centro which is kind of the more old looking buildings um there's a huge cathedral um yeah the buildings look really antique antique i think that's the word um and it's got a really awesome feel to it. It's, it kind of has a European Spanish feel to it almost. Um, I wasn't in that area though. So um, that's the center. And there's just thousands of people. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And they're just cramming in the streets. And that's not only for the center. In Mexico City, every single street is full of people. The buildings are all touching as in every building, there's no separation. There's no yards in front of their houses or, or big patios or small patios. They're, they're just apartment touching apartment or house touching a house. And um, they have kind of a garage um, and, a, and a door leading to their house. And inside of those houses, there's three or four generations of people. <laughs> That's why Mexico City is so amazing is that you'll get the great grandmas with the, the great grandchildren and that house is just packed with aunts, uncles, dogs, cats, and it's just a riot in each house. Um, so there's always, there's something called the Tianguis, which is a real Mexico City thing. Um, those Tianguis are um, kind of street vendors. They have big pink and purple and red tents. And it's really fun atmosphere that um, anyone can vent, uh, can vend, can sell. Anyone is allowed to sell and they come and bring their own things. and Or they're, they're, that's their specific job is that they sell food or fruit or um, shoes or socks or clothes, whatever it is. And it's really cheap clothing. If you think about DI or something, Desert Industries, it's kind of that stuff. Um, and you can go and buy anything for a really cheap price. But that's a really fun atmosphere is that people are yelling and, and saying, hey, it's cheap prices. And then they're yelling and saying stuff about the Americans. And it's a fun atmosphere. Um, and we got, we got to go there on um, preparation days just to do our shopping. It's cheaper food there. Not unhealthy sometimes. I mean, it can be. But that's where we would spend some time on P-Day's buying our our needed needs um the cars there's a lot of slug bugs <laughs> that's kind of all for latino countries a lot of slug bugs um it's a, it's a traffic based city there's just so much traffic and it's at different times but you 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 kind of learn when are the when what streets have a lot of traffic at which hour um and you, there's a lot of buses. They're called micros again, or camiones. And the micros are a little smaller. They're kind of like a condensed bus. And you kind of, it just, it comes down the street. You wave at it, and it stops. And you get on, and you give the, the guy, you, you say, we're paying for two, or you're paying for yourself, whatever. Um, but always with two, obviously, with missionaries. And so he takes us 
he just goes on his route and we kind of just jump off when we need to. And it's so awesome. It's so fun. Um, the same with the big buses, you kind of get on and then you jump off when you need to. They're just a lot bigger. Um, let's think they have, there, there are civilized cities. Some people don't really realize that about Mexico. I thought it was going to just be like dirt and donkeys. Um, not anything against Mexicans, but I just thought that from all the movies I've seen. So, um, it actually surprised me how modern it is and people have cell phones. People, I was thinking people in sombreros, um, they have teeth, they have hair, they have, they're normal, completely, completely normal people. And it shocked me. I remember thinking, wow, these people actually have style. And I just had no idea. Mexico City is a Book of Mormon land where many things happened from the Book of Mormon. and A lot of things took place. Um, so they consider, from what I understand, they consider Mexico City to be the land northward of the Book of Mormon when um, some of the prophets and stuff wrote about people traveling northward, north. Um, and so they consider that's where is Mexico City. And that, that's pretty sweet to think I was in Book of Mormon land. Um, they, they have pyramids there that are called, it's, I mean, there's lots of pyramids, but there's what they're famous for in Mexico City is something called Teotihuacan. It's kind of hard word to say. Um, and there's three big main pyramids and there's one that's called the sun. There's one that's called the pyramid of the moon. And there's one that's called Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, I don't know how you say it. And that's where they believe that Jesus Christ came down. Um, and it's, it's a pretty amazing place. I got to go there on a P day with some elders. Um, and this, the pyramid of the sun is the biggest and, and you get to look down and see other pyramids there, especially the big moon. That's the second biggest. And then the temple of Quetzalcoatl. And so that, that has a really, I don't know, you can kind of feel the spirit of the Book of Mormon there. You think, how, how, one, how did they build this? They're amazing. And two, it's pretty amazing that the book we believe so strongly in is, is this is it. Um, so as far as, as that goes, it's really awesome as a missionary and really awesome for the, the people to hear and to talk about them being descendants of Lamanites. Um, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing to testify to them saying that before they were Catholics, before they were from Spain and everything, um, they came from Jerusalem and had their own little civilization. Not little, huge. Um, they were as numbered as the sands of the sea. And it's amazing to say to them, you were Mormon, almost. Your, your, your ancestors were people of God. Before the, the Aztecs um, and the Maya cruel civilizations, they were a very pure, delightsome people, like it says. So they have serious traditions and cultures <clears throat> um, rooted in them. They, they believe firmly, firmly in maybe the Virgin um, from the Catholic Church. They believe firmly in they they believe firmly in Jesus Christ and, and Heavenly Father. They don't really know who they are and their relationship with them, but they they do believe very firmly in them. Um, they all have a belief in God. Um, their traditions could be as simple as um, having a party. They are a party people. Um, Every Saturday night, there's a party, and usually it's every two weeks because that's, those are the days when they get their money, so they, they party it up that night, and they spend all their money that they got. So they, they are party people, but it's a fun, uplifting party, and it's, they're fun to, I mean, us missionaries can't go, but we, we would obviously see them all down the streets because there's so many people, and there, it was fun to watch. Um, as far as more traditions go, they, they do feel like they need to stay strong in the Catholic Church sometimes. Um, and they, they feel like, oh, well, my ancestors are from it. And they, they, what would I say if I die and they see me and they, I can't even imagine telling them I changed religion. 
Um, but usually that's a pretty simple thing to change once they felt the Spirit. Um, once they feel the Spirit, they're willing to change anything. I think we all are. And so tradition-wise, um, I don't think it's a big deal as far as like the Catholic Church goes. I think you can overcome that with just a positive attitude and with faith. So the weather in Mexico City is perfect. It's in the summer from about, it's really hot, which is about 100, 110. Um, it's pretty hot from about May to probably June. No, that's probably, that's only two months, but that's when it's really hot. It's like a, probably April to June or July. And then it rains from like July till November, December. And it rains about every day, but not hard. It's just a nice, comfortable rain. But then there were days that were just downpours and where the water would come up even with the wind, car windows and us missionaries were just living the dream, puddle jumping and um, that's, those are the days when we would knock doors cause people would let us in obviously. Um, and, uh, let's think there were areas in Mexico city, which surprised me completely that I had, I mean, it's a mountainous area as Mexico city is. Um, and there were areas in our mission that would snow in the winter and that completely surprised me. I was thinking, no way. Um, but yeah, there were, there were missionaries that were up in the snow only a couple miles from us, but it was just such a altitude difference that, um, yeah, they were snow, they were, um, snowed in some days. Um, as far as like severe weather, just the flooding thing, um, with a lot of rain, it would kind of. Um, fill up the sewers and the drainage and stuff and the streets would just fill with water and that I like I said It was it was fun those days um, I want to trade that for the world um, But for the most part, it's it's around 70 to 80 degrees and I would say that's a consistent Consistent day in Mexico City is a 70 degree weather um, so I I never felt like I could complain about the weather because it was it was always perfect, just nice, cool, hot, mild temperature all in one. So, yeah. And it's actually surprising how well these Latinos know their, their history. I mean, I, I had a house, an apartment with, with six elders, and right outside it was a place called, um, let's think. Oh, man. It was a museum where... Um, the, the U S soldiers had come and had this huge, great battle with, with, uh, Mexico. And apparently there was Irish, the Irish nation was involved also. And it was an amazing thing that the United States did some kind of, they cheated the Irish in some way that the Irish became angry and all of a sudden switched sides in the middle of the battle pretty much and joined Mexico. And the both they um, they both ended up attacking the U.S. And I, I forget the details of what happened, but it's amazing to me how well the Mexicans or the Latinos know their history. I mean, you, I could ask any single person in that area or outside of it about it, and they would tell the year, they would tell the, the tell me the leaders. Um, they're very cultured as a, as as far as history goes. Um, they would talk comfortably about Aztecas and they wouldn't be like, Oh, what was the date? What was the date? They were straightforward. Oh, it was this date. And Hernan Cortez did this. And, um, the Spanish people, they, they built their synagogues over, over the, or not their synagogues, their cathedrals right on top of the pyramids that were, yeah, were already existing. And that's kind of sad in a way is that these beautiful pyramids, the Spanish felt like, no way are these people going to feel that we want them to be Catholic. So they built right on top of them, their, their cathedrals, which was kind of sad, but I mean, there's enough culture still that exists that it's like, oh, well, I can go somewhere else and see a pyramid. And I never, ever got sick in the mission. I, I, ate what everyone eats and I never really got sick. Um, the secret is to eat where most people are. If you see a big crowd of people on the side of the street, um, you know that place is famous for having good food and probably healthy food. So 
that's kind of what I tried to follow. Um, the water from the tap is very dirty and is the same water from the toilet pretty much. So you never drink that. Um, you can use it to wash your hands. Um, but um, they would purify their water and people would bring around big five gallon things of water and you'd buy that. And <clears throat> your companions kind of talk to you about that. And the Aztecs were people, from what I understand, were huge people. And there are still some purebred Aztecs that have survived. And they are probably seven feet tall. Um, and they're, because they're so tall, they're, they're big, big boned. And their heads are big, not like abnormally big. They're just big people. They're really broad shouldered and their hands are probably the size of, I don't know, like half my thigh. Um, they're big people. And now those people only marry among themselves to keep that blood keep continuing. Um, and there, there was a fun story that I heard that when Hernan, Hernan Cortes was a Spanish, I don't know if it was a general or what, but he rode into to Mexico City and there were Aztecs there. And I want to say the king of the Aztecs, whose name was Nesahuacoyot, it's a crazy name, Nesahuacoyot, um, I want to say it was him. If not him, it's, it's another one of those crazy names. But he went up and punched Hernan Cortez's horse in the face. So not he didn't punch Hernan Cortez out of mockery or anger. It was he punched his horse and knocked it out. So that's how, if you can get an idea of how big these people really are. And I always just loved, loved hearing that story. People would tell us a couple of times. And I know that as far as the church goes, a man named, I think his name was Moses Thatcher or Moses Thatcher. Um, it was Moses something. He climbed this giant volcano and he, he got to the top and he dedicated the land. He was an apostle, I think, at that time. And he dedicated the land of Mexico for the preaching of, of God. And it was really sweet because that there's two volcanoes, one called um, Popocatépetl, or Popo, Mount Popo, and Nessa, um, Iztaccíhuatl. So Popo and Iztaccíhuatl. And there's a cool story that there it was a love relationship and um, between the mountains and I think Popo died and so Iztaccíhuatl uh, was his girlfriend from another tribe and she killed herself and it, it's a love story kind of like Romeo and Juliet <clears throat> and that it's they're just giant beautiful volcanoes they're huge and that is where Moises Thatcher I want to say that. Um, he climbed to the top and did this great dedicatory mission prayer. So that was a great thing. In general, when you're in Mexico City, I would say um, travel with not that much money. Don't, don't have much money on you. Um, for sake, so, I mean, you hear that Mexico is a dangerous place. I never felt threatened ever in Mexico, but that was the general rule is that... Um, if something happened, you can give them quick a little money and they'll accept that. But if you don't have money, you're probably in trouble. But I never felt threatened, like I say, and most no, none of the missionaries in the mission did either. Um, um, coming from the airport, I felt safe always. Um, the secretaries picked us up and it was safe. Mexican food is amazing, and it's not really like what we think here in Utah, like Cafe Rio and stuff. That is my favorite restaurant, but it's they pride themselves in their food, and they pride themselves in their food being hot. Which mean, and it does isn't always hot, but they always have salsa, and it's not like our little chips and salsa. It's like real chili, and it's really hot. And they'll ask you, so you don't have to really worry about that. They don't. They're not there to just destroy your throat and your stomach. They'll ask you, Elder, do you like hot? And my companions loved it. And I, I was kind of like at the beginning, like hesitant. But yeah, you, you learn to like the chili. Um, so it's hot. It's, it's usually a big course. And it surprised me, I remember, is that the first days they bring out this big soup. And they call that sopa. 
and they, I ate the sopa and I was thinking, oh, that was delicious. Thanks, Hermana. And I thought it was over. And then she brought this huge salad and I was like, okay, luckily I'm a big eater. And I ate the salad and I was thinking, okay, I'm getting full. And this wasn't like a little salad. It was like, boom. Um, and then she took that away and my companion was still like looking all excited. And I was like, no way, is there more? And then it was like more just, but this is huge plate of, of this chicken thing. And I remember thinking, holy cow, I cannot eat that. And I, I ate it. And then she says, do you want more? And my companion looks at me like, yes, I do want more. And so I was like, oh boy. Okay. Yeah, I want more. And then, so I ate what I could from that. And then here comes the dessert. So I was thinking, oh, maybe it's just only her, but for two years, that was how it was with everyone. They just, and especially the more poor areas, which sounds kind of like a, a, I don't know if you want to call it a paradox or something, but the people that have less give more. They just love the missionaries and it's the members who give us food. Um, and they, they will give us all they have. And it's amazing. The best food I would say in Mexico city is the tacos. Um, there's some tacos called tacos al pastor and what it is, it's just a big chunk of meat in the side of the street and, and they have this really sharp knife and a knife and a pineapple on top of the meat. And so they, they, and the, there's this huge flame coming and burning the meat. And so they'll turn the meat and kind of have it all nice and toasty. And you just tell them, hey, I want three tacos. And they're like, all right. And so they cut off a huge chunk of the meat. And then they, uh, with the same knife, they grab the pineapple and flip it. And they, they do it in one motion. They flip off a little piece and it lands right on the taco. And then they'll get another pineapple. And, and each piece has one pineapple. It's just amazing how fast they are at it. Um, and so you eat your three and then you can yell at them, hey, I want 10 more. That was delicious. So they'll quickly cut off 10 more. And as they cut it, it falls under the tortilla. And then they flip off a pineapple. And it's just, they are so talented. And they're so fast. They can get 10 tacos it would take me probably five minutes to cut evenly, get a smooth, small little sliver. It takes them probably 20 seconds, two seconds each taco. It's amazing. Probably the funniest thing that I ate was a big cow tongue. And it was, it was about that big. And I remember it was hairy on top. And it looked like a big steak. <clears throat> and I was actually eating it. <clears throat> I was eating it with my mission president. And he, he looked at it like, oh, that's completely normal. And I was thinking, this thing has hair on it. And it did taste like a steak. It was kind of like still bleeding. It, it was like a raw steak almost, but it, it was actually really good. I prepared since I was born, I feel like. Well, like not saying I was perfect, but like saying I've always wanted to go on a mission. Um, and the day I found out about my mission call or where I was going, that same day I started reading the, the Book of Mormon in Spanish and English, like they show in Other Side of Heaven, the movie. And because I heard there was a promise that I'd be like fluent afterwards, you know. <clears throat> so that same day, I started reading it verse by verse. And and I actually had a really cool experience before that um, my one of my best friends is Elder Holland's granddaughter. And so she invited me to come meet him at Brick Oven where I worked. And I wasn't working that day, but I went and visited him and, and we got to talk and, and it was a really great experience because I got to meet him and his wife and they, they inspired me even more to be a, a great missionary. Um, but he ta I asked him about that promise. I said, is that true? If I read verse by verse, and by this time I had been reading for like four months, so I was hoping it was true. And he, he testified to me, actually, it was really cool. He told me that him and his wife, when they were mission presidents, they did it. Um, or when they were missionaries, I don't know what he said, but that they did it and that they both spoke and understood perfect Spanish. And so that, that really inspired me to just finish strong. And, and I entered into the mission or the MTC, I feel like speaking pretty good Spanish. So I never really had a problem with Spanish. So my favorite story, and this has to do with my hero. He's one of my heroes. Um, I was in my first area and at this point I was training and, and there was, there was a problem of drugs in that area that, that, and there was, there was just a huge concentration of, of teenagers slash adults that would do drugs. And there was one guy in particular, his name was Christian that would 
pride himself in yelling at us, and he he was the drug lord of that area, and he he tried to make a point that he was in charge, and he would yell at us and and swear at us and stuff, and and we would just laugh. He was a fun guy, and we would just laugh, and it kind of made him want to come on more because he thought, oh, it's not ma- it's not affecting him, so I'll just step up my game. Um, and so he, I mean, if it was so bad that I, like I said, it was 30 streets big. So we always were walking past his house and it was so bad that when he wasn't outside, it was, we would pass and someone would go get him and he would come after us and we would be like, Oh boy, here he comes again. And we had never really talked to him though, but we would talk to his friends and he was the, like I said, the leader of them all. And there was one day that I, me and my companion were, were teaching some of his friends in the side of the street. And he, um, well, the, the, it was amazing because we were teaching these kids. And like I said, in Mexico City, there's hundreds of people. So when, when a small group accumulates, it, it, it can immediately get just massive amounts of people. So we were teaching these two kids and people would, and we're sitting down and people would come and, and kind of linger and so instantly this became a multitude and it was awesome for me and my companion. We felt like Jesus Christ and his apostles um, as if it was a sermon on the mount. We were we were pumped because we were teaching the plan of salvation and, and people would come and we would notice and they'd come out and we, they would leave or some people would linger and then and really get an interested look on them. And it's hard to kind of personalize it to 50 people or more. So we would kind of just talk and we'd just trade turns. We, we would ask questions but kind of just more talk and let people all have a chance to hear about our message. And I remember as we were talking, this guy, Christian, came up. And I remember kind of like grabbing my companion's leg and thinking, I, 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 like looking at him and saying, are you seeing this? He's here. Christian's here. And he's going to ruin this lesson. And my companion, he was new. Like I said, he was, he was a trainee. So he, he froze up like, oh, no. And... He, he kind of stopped in the middle of a sentence and passed the time over to me. And so I was like, all right, I got to set the example. And so I continued with why we were here on this earth. And I noticed he, he didn't have a look of, of disgust on him. He had a look of interest. And I, I kind of thought it was a dare for him to come over. I was like, oh, someone dared him to come over. But he, he stayed with that look. And we got to the point where we talked about this life, af- the life after this life. Um, or the spirit world, and we told everyone that we know where we're going, and we testified. And I remember, I'll never forget the look on his face, and he raised his hand, and he said, whoa, and he knew we were elders, so he says, elders, you mean to tell me that you know where we're going after this life? And I I thought he was like going to just shove it back in our face and just say something weird or mean or something, and my companion kind of looked at him like, you want to answer? And he, he was like, no. So I was like, all right, I'll take it. And I said, yeah, we do know where we're going. And I tried to stay with as much confidence to show him, you can't phase us, man. We're missionaries of God. And and he says, how do you know that? And again, I thought, I don't know. I, he, I feel like this is just too good to be true that he's interested. I mean, after all, I've been here for six months. I don't believe this is happening. Um, so... Again, I said, well, we know because we have, and we explained the Book of Mormon quickly, and we, and, and then he was like, okay, how can I know for myself if, if I, where I'm going after this life? And I said, you know what? This Sunday is general conference. That's when our, our prophet and 12 apostles, um, that's when all our, to me, our most amazing leaders talk. And, and if you really are interested, Christian, you can come and watch. And it's only two hours. You can come and just, mainly feel if it's true or not so he says okay i'll be there and he he's he points at us and we're like okay do you want us to pass by he's like no i'll I'll go i know where it is i've been there or i've like seen it on the side of the street so we're like okay we'll see you there at 11 o'clock so we go at 11 on sunday and to be honest that was about three days later so i had kind of forgotten it. we had invited about six billion people so i kind of had forgotten that we invited him um, and so we were focusing on the investigators that had come and the members that would sit with them. And we put, we made the point to put the investigators in the front of the chapel. Um, and I'll never forget 
when we were outside talking with members and preparing for this this com- this um, session, when I look outside the the gate of the church and here comes Christian, and he he had usually crazy hair, but he had kind of parted it and kind of came with this run- wrinkled, beat up shirt, but he had tried to button it the best he could, and he, it was apparent that he had tried to look the best, and he had earrings all over his face, but he was looking good. And so we gave him this huge hug and said, oh, Christian, I can't believe you came. He said, of course I'll come. And he had this attitude of like, well, let's see what you got. So we put him right in the middle, right where he can see the best, right where he can hear the best. And I went upstairs and I heard it in English because I wanted to get out what I could of, of the conference. And my companion, who was Latino, stayed and listened to it in Spanish. And I just remember thinking this was the best conference I've ever heard. It was, the music was perfect. The talks were, I, I can promise, were straight, dire, straightly directed towards him. I, I just felt amazing, and I thought, he's going to be baptized. Um, but obviously, I was nervous, thinking maybe he's got a pride issue, and I don't know. So I, I ran downstairs with the other elders. We met up with our companions, and we, we, were, we waited outside the doors for our investigators, and we talked with them. We put appointments, and uh, we talked with members. We put, we put appointments. And Christian still wasn't coming out of the door. And I remember asking my companion, did you not sit with him? And he said, no, I didn't sit with him. There wasn't room. And I sat with other pe- other investigators. I said, okay, did you see him? And he said, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, he stayed the whole time. I said, okay. And so I, I went and peeked into the chapel. And it was pretty much empty by this time. And he was still sitting there. And he, he had his head down. And I remember turning to my companion and said, oh, my goodness. He slept through the whole thing. He was asleep. And my companion was like, no. I was like, yeah, he's asleep in there. And he's like, I can't believe it. That was so amazing. And and I looked back in and he kind of had stirred. And so I was like, maybe he's not. Maybe he's just sitting there. I don't know. And I didn't really think that maybe he was just sitting there. It looked like he was asleep, which is a common occurrence in Mexico, I think, <laughs> during the general conference. And so I was sitting outside with my companion. We were, we were standing outside and he left the the chapel doors and came outside. Um, and it was just us three. And he had big red puffy eyes. And it's like how I look when I cry. So I knew instantly someone had touched him. And he came right up to me and he had his head down. And he... He came up to me. And he, he put his finger in my chest. And he knew my name. Um, we had talked before, so he knew I was Elder Bodine. And he he looks me in the eyes, and with tears coming down even more, he says, Elder Bodine, what was that that I just saw? Who were those men that spoke with such an energy, he says, a power that I've never felt in my entire life. He says, what was that music that I was hearing? I felt as if angels were singing. And he cries even more. He says, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And he points to my companion and he says, why are you both so amazing? Why are all these people so happy? I've never seen such happy people in my life. I had no words. I was crying. And he says, how can I know this is true? Because I think it is. We testified right there to him that it was. We gave him a Book of Mormon and told him to read it. Um, We put an appointment with him, but we couldn't wait. Next day was our P-Day, so we went straight to his house, even on our P-Day. And he had read till Alma in the Book of Mormon. And the best part of that was that he testified to us in that lesson that it was true. We didn't even have to say anything. He said, I've read enough that I know this book is true and I'm willing to do anything to change. He had already taken out some earrings. We told him to take out a couple more and he took them all out and he threw them, I remember. And he threw them and he said, no, no way am I putting another earring in. Um... We invited him to church the next Sunday, and our church started at 7. He was there probably at 5.30. He was ready to go with the best-looking clothes he's ever worn. He had his hair combed, and 
He didn't miss a church meeting after that. He got a call, he got baptized within two weeks. We invited him to be baptized that first lesson, and he accepted like that. I don't think we needed to ask him. I think he would have asked us. Um, but he, Christian, is without a doubt my hero. Because it's someone that completely changed his life. And I've never, never loved someone like I love Christian. I remember when I left that area, I hugged him until his eyes, eyes bulged out. And he cried. But I remember just thinking, this is a man. Someone that really knows and understands the atonement of Jesus Christ. He's someone that I can just look up to for the rest of my life. And because of him, he has friends that have been baptized, family members that have been baptized. He has a calling. Um, he's my hero. My first day I got there and my companion told me that we were showering from a bucket. And I said, what the heck is that? And he says, yeah, the water, uh, he, if you fill it up with water, and um, in our case, we put an iron in the bucket, which isn't very safe, but that was only for him. <laughs> when, whenever we did it for the rest of the mission, we would put a, a big hot thing that's specifically for it. You put it in the water, and it heats up the water, and you plug it in, and it's safe, completely safe, that one. Um, and yeah, once the water gets hot, you grab a cup, and you just start bathing yourself, and that was that was to me for me a awesome experience thinking I didn't care about showering it was just I'm having the real experience I, I really like that and most people do that in Mexico um, they don't, there's not much water because if you think about it 24 million or whatever people um, you kind of have to save the water so showering from a bucket is a lot less water I had a personal goal in my mission to feel the spirit as much as I possibly could um, saying, and I, as I talk about this, I hope you understand why just because a missionary has to understand that it's all by the spirit. And if he doesn't have the spirit, he has nothing like the scriptures say. So um, talking to whatever audience, I think um, that my, the biggest thing I learned without a doubt is to understand and recognize and follow the spirit. Um, at the beginning of my mission, I wasn't, I was kind of bummed because you always hear about the missionaries that have those, Hey, go to knock this door and go yell at this person to tell him about Jesus Christ, not yell at him, but shout it from the rooftops. And I wasn't really having those experiences and it kind of frustrated me like, why? Um, I'm, I'm being perfectly obedient as far as I know. So what's going on? And I just remember that that desire to feel the Spirit as much as I could. Um, and then I remember um, just committing myself in prayer with all the energies of my heart, saying, Heavenly Father, I will run your errands, like our my our prophet always says. I will run your errands. Um, you can you can trust me. I will anything you tell me to do, I will do. And if you don't tell me, um, I will do what I feel is right always. And I remember that same day I had two amazing experiences where I felt impressed to contact two people. And it was so simple and so basic, the impression was so impacting to my spirit and to my entire being. I remember thinking, that's what it feels like. Just two little, hey, I was walking and contact this. And I was thinking, okay. And, and it was just amazing. And I remember that night getting down and saying, can I have more? And just, I want more. Not for pride's sake. That was just the best thing I've ever felt. Um, knowing that I did what you asked me to. <laughs> and, nope, sorry. <laughs> um, and I remember that desire completely completely progressed to a desire to always feel it um, the spirit or the promise in the sacrament is that we can always have the spirit to be with us and I thought 
I want it always. <laughs> I just, I always imagine the apostles and prophets always having it. Um, so I had that desire. And I remember when I first started feeling those impressions and stuff, I would kind of just feel like, hey, you, this would be good. Like a little impulse to do something. And I remember um, following it was kind of hard thinking, was it me or the spirit? But as I followed it more and more and more, um, it kind of became a more powerful impression in, in that sense. It became not like, is that me or the spirit? It just became like, no, that's definitely the spirit. It's a feeling that I'm used to. <clears throat> and I really liked that. And it became comfortable. But, and there were times, honestly, when I didn't follow it or out of fear or out of, out of t uh, the sake of time for getting to an appointment or something. And there were times that I did not And I remember just feeling guilt and just feeling like, oh, man, I let the Lord down like nobody's business. Um, and so my desire to follow it, sorry. It, it, it grew and grew and grew until instead of when it first started out as tiny impressions grew to as strong impressions, it soon became words and mixed with, imp with feelings. And it, it, instead of being like a feeling to do something or to contact someone, it became contact that girl across the street, something really clear. And that's something that I always thought the apostles and prophets had. And I felt like that was a special gift that only a few select could get. Um, and that I would be very lucky or if, if at all I could have that. And I, I tell you this because I really learned that anybody can do it. If me, Jared Bodine, could feel the spirit as a strong impression mixed with words and clarity in its voice. I want the whole world to know that if I can, you can. You know, does that make sense? I want the whole world to know that the Spirit is always there if we want it there. And He is always wanting us to be happy or to make others happy. And he, He's got errands for us to run. Or the Lord has errands for us to run. And it was, it was always amazing for me. It became so awesome to have a threesome companionship. And I'd never really understood what that means, but when the Holy Ghost was a part of it, it was three. And it became so much, I had a companion for 10 months that he kind of had the same impression-wise feelings. Um, and it, would be, it was so fun. And he would say, hey, I'm feeling something. And I, I, if I wasn't, then I'd say, what are you feeling? And, and we would work together as a team and the spirit would direct us. If it, if it was me feeling it, I would say, hey, I don't know what. We're supposed to contact someone. And my companion would look around and, and we'd look for the nearest person. Or we'd, we'd spread out and get someone across the street and I'd be on this side. But it became a threesome companionship, which I don't think I could have had more fun in my entire life. Um, so t speaking to whatever audience, I would say the most... If there is a classification of something being fun, I think it's following the spirit. I've played sports my whole life. I've gone to school. I've known great people. I've had fun, but never have I had fun like following the Holy Ghost, if that makes sense. I've never had more, more excitement, more just absolute love for something than following his voice. I would say that is the definition of fun, is following the Holy Ghost. And I think I could get better at it, honestly. But it's it's fun. Well, I mean, I had an experience in the mission that <clears throat> I didn't... I saw this big five-gallon thing of water, and I thought it was clean, obviously, because it was in that, that normal thing I always drink. Um, and it was actually from the tap water. So I drank it for days and days because I was on exchanges for a leadership thing. And I drank it and, and the next day I was like dehydrated and I drank it again and I felt like a little sicker. 
And I was like, what's happening to me? And it was because <clears throat> I had <clears throat> no money. I had been drinking the water from the tap, which like I said, is the same water from the toilet. Um, and yeah, I, I got a little sick from that. And I admonish everyone to not drink it. <laughs> you just don't feel good. What I really liked from the very beginning is that in Mexico City, there's, I mean, it's a city of millions of people. Um, and so there are literally hundreds of people in the street always. And I, I was in a street, I was in an area very, very small for our mission. And it was probably 30 streets. It wasn't that many streets, to be honest. It took five to 10 minutes to cross. Um, and I remember being like completely amazed by how these streets are. Just like, how do people find their way around? Um, and my companion was so comfortable about it. He was a Latino companion. Um, and I just remember loving with every fiber of my being how many people there were that we could contact. There was no, no excuse not to contact. You could contact a group of 50. You could contact a, a person um, by himself. But there was no reason not to contact. And that, I remember just thinking that whole first week thinking, this is the best mission a, a kid can have. Because if I, want, if I want to teach, I will teach like crazy. Because there's so many people who want this. If I want to contact, there's a contacting opportunity. Um, I remember there's buses called Micros in Mexico City. And I just remember this great desire to contact, but being just scared out of my life to do it. And my companion was scared too. He was really far in the mission, but he was just scared. So we didn't ever contact the buses when I first started, but that's later we did. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else in my first couple of weeks. I just remember being impressed by how amazing this, these people are. The Mexican, Mexico City is just full of, humble people i could approach and they're used to meeting people they're completely used to it that a, a random american can come up to them and and ask them something about god and they they're used to talking to strangers used to being sold something so it's not unnatural for them to to be talking about something there is a saying that they say mexicans don't ever talk about politics and god because then they just get an uproar but i didn't believe that i think they were very very open and it was amazing. Um, I really liked that. My first couple of weeks thinking, these people are open and they'll accept what I have. One really awesome aspect of the mission is how close you, you come to your family members at home. And I, I grew up in a family where I knew exactly where my family stood in the gospel. I saw my parents, I don't know how many times, studying the scriptures. Um, and I, we had our family nights. We had everything. And I feel like I never had trials. I still don't feel like I've ever had trials um, that really were impacting. Um, but something that really was awesome for me in the mission was the relationship I learned between father and son. And I'm, I can only compare it to one thing. It's the relationship my father in heaven has with me, with my relationship with my dad. And my dad's, I would consider him, if he has one quality, it's purity. He's just a pure, good man. And he's just so sincere and humble. And I remember my, one of my greatest desires was to make him proud. Super proud of the missionary that I was. Because he would talk about his mission and he never ever talked about specifics, which kind of saddened me. But something that he always said was, I don't have any regrets. And I was always like, but no, I don't care about your regrets or whatever. Throw that aside. What's a story? And he's just like, you know, what? I, I could go on all day, but I just want you to know. And like I, he just kept coming back to the regret thing. No regrets. And I was always just like, all right, well, I know where my dad stands is he's a person without regrets. And I, I, I had that goal without any doubt is that in my mission, I would have no regrets. And so my goal became... It, and it it grew is that I wanted to make both my dads proud. And I there were times that I would be walking and I'd feel the spirit. And I, I one of my favorite words is the word buddy. Is, is calling someone my buddy or hearing that I'm their buddy. And I remember one clear day is I was really excited about a lesson but also nervous because I wanted it to go well. And I remember this, this strong impression to saying, 
hey buddy, it'll go great. Don't worry about it. And I just wanted to break down and weep, thinking Heavenly Father knows that when I hear the word buddy, and let alone from him, that's a big day for me. And so I remember when I heard him call me buddy, I thought, man, he is my buddy. I'm his buddy. That's awesome. And then as my mission was drawing to a close, I, I, I wanted something really bad. And that was to hear my dad write to me or over the phone say he's proud. Of, I always knew he was, but I wanted to hear it. And I remember... Um, coming home with the desire to have hug him first off the airport, thinking that it was a symbol of someday when I return to my Heavenly Father, um, I'm, I want to hug Heavenly Father with all, until his eyes bulge out. And I want to hug him and hug him and hug him. And I remember that was one of my greatest desires was to hug my dad in the airport and tell him I gave my all and, and have him hear, just hear him whisper and mo and say to my ear, I'm proud of you, buddy. And fortunately, it did happen. And he didn't even know that was my desire. But the relationship we have with our dads is everything to me. And I think everyone should have a father like that. Or everyone should be a father like that. And so if I have any advice or whatever you want to call it, it's have that relationship with your Heavenly Father. Um, make him your buddy and be his buddy because um, it's so worth it. I envy you. Very few people have such a great opportunity as you do to go to such an amazing place. Mexico City South is the best mission on this earth. The spirit there is so strong. I, I can't even imagine if there was a, a meter that can measure the amount of love I feel towards those people, I think it would shatter. I love those people. And like I say, I envy you completely that you can go and start what I loved doing for two years. Nothing on this earth compares to what I did there or what you're going to do. If I, had if I have advice for you, contact every single person. Never let your mouth close. Get on every bus and contact every single person on that. Shout your testimony to the ends of the earth. Make sure that everyone knows your last name and who you represent. Another piece of advice is don't listen to any lazy people. Don't let a lady, a lazy missionary, a lazy member, a lazy family member ever get into your heart. Work until you drop. My personal goal was to come off the plane in a wheelchair or a stretcher. Because I worked myself to death. The last thing that I want to say, the thing that has impacted my life the most,
is my, I have a personal goal to have every single person that I meet hear my testimony. That's why I envy you because for two years you get to do that. I envy the apostles and prophets who get to do that as a full-time career, we could say. The last thing I want to say to you is that I, Jared Bodine, know that a missionary is called of God. That he represents Jesus Christ for two years. That Jesus Christ is perfect. He did perform the atonement. It's real. I know the plan of salvation is real too. I know where I'm going after this life. I've known it since I was 11 years old, and I have not looked back. I testify that Jesus Christ is my Savior, that His Father and mine is Heavenly Father, who I love. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So the first day, because I had actually never been out of the country before, and so it was kind of exciting to go to Mexico. And just being in the plane, because, I mean, we got out, I remember we were always, like, trying to guess when we were crossing the border and things like that, just because, you know, I never left the country before. But I remember as we approached the city, like, you look out the airplane window, and it's just this huge, huge city. Like, I mean, I've been to Los Angeles before, but, I mean, it's just a little, it's even bigger than Los Angeles. I mean, it's just crazy. And just the, everything is just super, super chaotic and just hundreds of thousands of people in the airports. So, I mean, at first I was a little like scared because I mean, I've never been in that kind of a situation before and didn't really know what to expect. And then, you know, one thing that really helped was seeing the mission president, like just how excited he was and um, just him talking to us, just telling us that everything's going to be okay that, you know, because I was really scared because I'd heard, you know, all, you always hear those scary stories that happen to, you know, people in other countries and stuff like that, especially in cities as big as Mexico City. So I, mean, I remember that and then I remember one thing that really helped was the you know, the assistants talking to us and the secretaries. They talked to us when we arrived and they, they talked to us in English and told us a little bit about the culture. I remember we got to try some of the food, which that was actually one of the things that really helped me because I mean I was like I mentioned a little bit scared, but seeing the food there, just trying it. Uh, really helped me to like be happier because it was just so delicious and to this day and still my favorite food ever from Mexico and so that was really good I think and then just having an interview with the mission president um, like what he said that he was he himself was still trying to learn a little bit of English because he was from Mexico and so I mean his English was really good but just him saying that really really helped me to kind of open up and He's like, you know, don't be afraid because he asked me one thing I was concerned with and I told him, well, I've never been out of the country. So, I mean, because I felt, I felt decently okay with the language, at least what I thought in the MTC. But, I mean, obviously when you get out in the field, it's, it's a whole different thing. But just having him there, having him talk to me about that, just telling me that, you know, yeah, the culture is going to be different. But one thing he told me, he's just like, don't worry about all that because all that stuff will, it'll all just fall into place. He just told me to worry about, you know, studying, fi focus on studying and re really remember my purpose as a missionary. And then he told me that the spirit would help me to adjust to the culture. And that if I didn't worry so much about, you know, being like scared of the people, of the culture, of what, my environment, that I'd be able to be a more effective missionary. So I think that really helped me throughout my mission to, to really remember that it didn't matter that, I mean, obviously I don't look like the people from Mexico. I mean, my, my accent was not very good. My skin color is different, everything. But just being able to remember my purpose as a missionary and focus on the doctrine, I think, really was what, what helped me a lot. And just from that moment, I, I felt a lot better about being in Mexico, even though, you know, it's a completely different world from here. So in Mexico City South, I mean, there's the first official, like, stake, I guess, Ermita in Mexico, the first stake that was established. And then also one of the oldest meeting houses in San Pedro in Mexico and the whole country. So, I mean, that's pretty significant. And there's, I mean, there's, there's obviously, there's the temple there, which was the first temple in Mexico. And I believe one of the first temples outside of the United States. I mean, I don't know all my history on that, but one of the first ones in, in like the South America and Latin America area. So, I mean, that's pretty significant. And that the temple itself wasn't inside my mission, but Mexico City being so small and and with so many people living so close together, I mean, we could get to the temple in like less than an hour or an hour depending on traffic. So, I mean, it was all really close. 
but I mean the thing that was that's unique about my, about Mexico City South I would say is that we have that Ermita one which was the first steak and then uh, we had the we have that San Pedro which was like one of the first chapels built and they still use the original chapel I mean they built another one but they still use it even though it's like I don't know exactly how old but I think at least like 80 or 90 years old or maybe even older than that. So I mean, that's pretty significant. And then just, I mean, because in my mission when I came, there was, um, we had, I think it was seven or eight stakes or nine stakes, I think. And then they built another day, um, reorganized the mission, created the Mexico City Chalco mission. And so some of our stakes went over there and some of our stakes went to the Southeast. So I mean, that's kind of unique, just the growth of the church in Mexico City South, because I mean, it's it's so close to like the airport and so close to everything that it's just really, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of members in the mission in Mexico City South just because of the, the high population. But I mean, it's pretty similar to all of Mexico City. It's all really populated, but I think those two things are probably the most unique. And then just um, the, the special, I mean, the geography. I don't know if you want me to talk about the geography, but I mean, the geography about Mexico City South, one thing that's unique, and actually one of the areas where I was in is, is called Contreras. And most of the city is just like, I guess you could say a city jungle, houses next to houses next to houses, and um, factories and things like that. But in this area, it's kind of more up on the hill. And so it's a, actually one of the larger areas of the mission. Um, just because there's actually like a bunch of like uh, I guess you could say like forest behind it, um, so I mean it actually does get pretty cold because uh, Mexico City in general, I mean, not only just the South Mission, but it's pretty high in elevation. I think it's about somewhere around ten thousand feet. I think I'm not exactly sure. I just know it's higher than here, so I mean it does get pretty cold even though it is further south. So that was one thing that was kind of unique um, being up there. I guess just being in the the forest area. I actually had a lot of cool experiences up there, but so that was one thing is kind of like being in a side of a forest inside of a city. So it was actually kind of a cool, neat, neat part of, of Mexico City because that's a lot of a lot of times that's not what you see. I mean, obviously people come to Mexico City to see the downtown area, but and then they also have a, a park called Xochimilco, which is really unique in Mexico City just because of the it has like rivers running through it, kind of like in in Venice, Italy. So I mean, that's kind of cool. Obviously, as missionaries, we couldn't you know go on any of those boats or do anything with the water and stuff but just being able to see it was kind of cool so i mean that's kind of some unique things about mexico city is south mission comparing to other parts of mexico city so i mean obviously most of mexico is catholics i mean that's a big thing um i guess just religiously the culture it's probably about 80 percent catholic or so or the ones that don't go to church they say they're catholic just because it's become part of the culture and then as far as like preparation what i think i would say would be learn to work with members because with mexico city um this is kind of unique at the beginning of my mission they had us knocking doors and things like that and i remember when i first arrived we only did this for about like three or four weeks and so it wasn't actually very effective just because i mean in, in a city of like 25 million people you know knocking doors there's a lot of people that are at work that aren't going to be home so it's ends up being a lot of time wasted and so what they had us do is they told us that after a certain point we were not going to be allowed to knock any more doors unless we were strongly prompted by the spirit to do so so I thought that was interesting because you know growing up you hear about missionary work and tracting and, you know you think of going to knock on doors and things like that um, but one thing that they that my mission president really stressed to us to do and it, which I would suggest doing um, to prepare for a mission is just, he always told us to teach less active members and teach members. So we would even be teaching members about the restoration, you know, the basic missionary lessons. And then he would always tell us to ask the, the three questions. That's what my mission president, I guess, for me kind of like coined. So he said, um, you know, who do you know that could benefit from what you felt? It's like we'd always change it a little bit, the question, if we talked about Joseph Smith, like we would teach an active member who do you know that could benefit from you know feeling the blessings of the restoration and so we would always just ask and who else and who else you know we just keep asking those other questions and then we'd always ask well when can we visit those those um those people and so that was something that was really effective because you know you in mexico city you knock down all these huge apartment complexes with like 600 people that live there but you only end up getting one appointment and it takes you four hours to knock every single door but if you teach a member for 20 minutes they give you they can give you a referral and then you know you're able to to teach more more families out of that and then the, the families that you teach have a support system so I mean that was probably the biggest change I saw while I was down, down there um, in Mexico the way that they work because um, there's there's tons and tons and tons of less actives in Mexico City and one of the wards I was at uh, there's about probably at least a thousand members on the list, but attending the ward, 
there's about you know 100 to 150 give or take and so we really strive to focus on teaching less active members and we would teach them and ask them who they know and half the time the people that they knew were you know their family members that hadn't been baptized yet that were living with them so i feel like that was pretty effective so i would say that um, that's definitely something i'd recommend doing is just learning the basic missionary doctrine the lessons and even just learning how to ask ask your friends if they know anyone that could benefit from you know feeling the spirit and just getting used to doing that because i feel like that's a lot more effective that's how we found all the, a lot more of the people that we were going to baptize i mean obviously there's always that time when you're in the street and you're going to feel prompted to you know contact someone or whatever but it's always a lot more effective i feel like to ask the members plus it gets them involved so the investigators have a support system so i think that that's the biggest change that i saw as far as missionary work goes in mexico city so one thing that we started focusing on really, because um, I mean, obviously um, you have all the key indicators, you know, you keep track of investigators in church, but we actually started keeping track of less actives that would attend church as well. So we would, you know, focus on them. And from the less active families that we were teaching was where we actually often found most of our new investigators. I remember there's, there's, uh, bunch of different families that we would teach we would just go down the list and find people and teach them and we'd find out that they have you know three or four kids that hadn't been baptized yet so then we would be able to baptize the fam the, the kids after we reactivate the family so I mean that definitely helps because it um, strengthens the whole family and not just you know because a lot of times it's it's not easy to join the church especially because in Mexico the culture is so different um, between the Catholic culture and the Mormon culture just because I mean, the Sabbath day is a big thing and, you know, the word of wisdom, obviously, and law of chastity, things like that. So, I mean, having a whole family makes it a lot more effective for the missionaries because you feel better and then for the investigators as well. As far as numbers, I'm not exactly sure on the exact amounts, but after we did that, I do know that our baptisms did start to, to go up and the number of lessons we taught also increased because we had the goal to teach 40 lessons a week. And it was actually, I mean, it's definitely doable just because in a city like Mexico City, there's just thousands of people to teach. So we actually oftentimes would have too many people to teach. And so that's why, once again, we'd have to decide, all right, well, we need to focus on those who are going to progress the most. And so we would teach the less actives because they had invest they had investigator family members. And then they'd be able to benefit the whole family, not just the one investigator that we're teaching. So, so I served from... I guess MTC June 2012 and then, or July 2012 and then I finished in June 2014. Started my mission in the Barrio Natavitas and then after Natavitas I went to Barrio Reforma and then after that I went to Contreras and my third area, then my fourth area after Contreras was Iztacalco and then after Iztacalco I went to Churubusco and then after that, so that was my fifth area, then my last area where I was there for one transfer was Coyoacan, and that's where I finished my mission, side six. So they're all within Mexico City just because the city is, I mean, it's it's huge, as, but it's, so, I mean, it's all in one city. I mean, the areas were, some of them were pretty small, some of them were larger, but they're all within the same city limits, so. Well, one thing that's really different, I mean, kind of like what I mentioned is, I mean, it's different from city to city in the United States, but the size of Mexico City, because the houses are literally like this, like they'll be wall to wall. And in some of the houses, you'll have like 14 people that live in like a two bedroom house and things like that. Like you just see stuff like that all the time. So, I mean, that's definitely different. And also, I mean, even just washing clothes, like a lot of places you have to wash clothes by hand. So, I mean, that's one thing that I learned to do. I mean, uh, it was something that you take for granted here, having a washer and dryer. It's actually super nice. And then, I mean, um, another thing that's different is one thing that I actually really like better about Mexico versus here. So, I mean, here in the United States, to get groceries, you have to go to like, you know, Walmart, Smith's or Macy's or your local grocery store. But in Mexico, especially in Mexico City, they have little tiendas or little stores like on every single corner, on every street, there's like two or three. So, I mean, you, you don't have to go far. I mean, obviously you can't find what you can find in a Walmart there, but it's good, especially, I mean, as missionaries, you're in the street and you, you get hungry, you know, you go buy a little, little, um, appetizer thing for like you know five pesos or whatever so it's just really nice that's one thing that i actually would really like to see here as far as you know like the the food goes because it does get super inconvenient sometimes to have to drive all the way out to a walmart whereas there you can go out and you can walk literally about 50 meters and then you arrive at, an, at a tienda and then you can buy all the essentials tortillas that's one thing i also miss is the tortillerias that they have like everywhere all the tortillas that they, they eat, they use tortillas as napkins and they use them as like forks. They, they eat tortillas with almost every single meal, which is 
I mean, here we, we eat Mexican food, but it's not the same thing. I mean, it's similar in a lot of aspects, but that's one thing that I really think is pretty different as far as life goes, just the, the convenience. I mean, I would say it's a lot more convenient to actually live in Mexico City, just because it kind of like it's that huge city, everything's so close to you. Like there would literally be people that would live the, their whole entire lives without ever leaving the city limits. Just because, I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously some people wouldn't want to do that, but you you can stay because there's no reason. I mean, you can find everything you need in the city. So that's one thing that's definitely different because, I mean, here you have to go to different stores and different places. Your work is oftentimes in another city, but there everything's just so close. You don't, you know, you can walk to work. You can take public transportation. The public transportation here, I mean, in New York and Los Angeles, obviously it's going to be better, but here in Utah, I mean, it's... It's not that convenient because I mean, I've, there's been times before I had my car would have to take tracks, and I'd have to you know take the front runner train. But in Mexico, it's so much more convenient because there's taxis all over, and all you have to do is just hold your finger up like that, and you can grab a taxi, and the taxi can take you to the subway station. Then you just pay like they raised the price while I was there, but like five pesos, and you can go in the subway, which can pretty much get you from anywhere in the city from one point to another, and then you would not have to transfer to a bus. But it's one thing that's definitely more convenient about living there. I mean, here, I mean, now that I have a car, it's not a problem getting around, but without a car, it's definitely easier to live there than here. So, I mean, those are just, just kind of some basics as far as um, lifestyle versus here versus there. In Mexico City, it's it's really unique in the fact of kind of like the elevation I mentioned earlier. So there's pretty much three seasons in Mexico City. You have the hot season, you have the wet season, and you have the cold season. So in Mexico City, it rains a ton. There's a lot of rain, like it just floods the street. And especially when I was in my, one of my areas in Contreras, that the area that was above the whole city, kind of in the forest area, I was there during the... Uh, the end of the cold season beginning of the rain season and so it would rain almost every day and we'd have umbrellas but we would still just come back soaking wet and actually get pretty cold because we were higher than the rest of the city so i mean that's one thing that's different because i mean here i mean uh, well utah it's kind of unique you get this every single season in one day some days but but it's not definitely not as exaggerated down there with those the way that they have it, it gets it gets extremely hot it gets fairly cold it doesn't get quite cold enough for snow i mean every once every like 20 or 30 years it'll snow but it does get very fairly cold and um, it also gets super wet when it rains so that's kind of what the weather's like down there so when you had to adjust to that I mean as a missionary we'd have to have our warm coats which I actually didn't bring one with me from because I didn't think I would need it um, so I mean that's definitely one thing I'd recommend preparing if you know you're gonna go to Mexico City then you know you're gonna want to bring a coat rain coat in a nice warm coat for the winter. So that's something that's really unique. And then as far as the uh, the crime rate goes, I mean, there's a lot more crime down in Mexico City just because the way that police handle crime is a little bit different. I mean, it's not as effective down there. It's more, I guess, kind of chaotic, less organized. Actually, for me, I mean, there was two times when I had a kind of a run-in with that. We got mugged once. So we got me and my companion got beat on the back of the head and then uh, we had to give up all our money. So, I mean, I didn't like that because I'd only been out for like three months. And so I was still kind of wasn't super comfortable with the language yet. So that was not very fun. And then in one of my other areas, there's this guy that followed us. And then the next day when we left, he had broken into our apartment and taken everything. So I lost my camera, all my money, everything. So that was not fun either. I mean, there's definitely a lot more crime and um, just because when you call the police, it's not as quick like here where, you know, you call the police and they come right away to take care of it. And just because there's, and a lot of it has to do with just the, when you get a city that size, there's just not enough um, police to, to solve every problem. And you get, you know, people stealing things a lot and people, just because when you get million, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in, in a crowd, there's always going to be bad stuff happening. Like people get trampled to go into the subway station sometimes because it gets so crowded, things like that. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot more crime there versus here. I mean, here it's it's a lot nicer. The, the crime rate's not as bad. I mean, obviously in those bigger cities, you get some of that, but not nearly as bad as what I saw in Mexico City. Like there'd be times where, you know, you just hear your the neighbors getting in fights and you'd hear gunshots at night every once in a while and things like that. You see people lying down on the street bleeding. So I mean, just kind of, kind of some scary things, 
but you know that's just the difference i guess so one thing that's different i mean kind of like the every there everyone takes public transportation and with work i mean a lot of people work within the city so they don't really have to go very far for work so that's kind of different and as far as wildlife goes i mean uh, in the city there's not really a whole lot i mean there's lots of pigeons there's lots of so sometimes there's a lot of mosquitoes in one of my areas there's a bunch of flies and then in other areas there's tons and tons and tons of dogs that just run crazy in the street lots of cats um, just all that so you see a ton of that and then in one of my apartments actually oh yeah, this is kind of different i guess we lived above a kitchen which is really common that you'll have like uh, little tiny stores selling things and then um, so then we lived above the kitchen so there was cockroaches in our apartment all the time so we one time we made a flamethrower and burned them because we got frustrated with them but so I mean, just things like that's kind of different and another thing too about the lifestyle is it's it's a huge cultural difference as far as the food goes versus here actually the first I was kind of it was kind of a I was kind of shocked to see it because I'd never been out of the country but it's like they have these tacos um, the most famous ones are tacos al pastor where they have this huge tower and then on the tower like this it's kind of like a tripod they have this huge like slab of meat and it's just they have it, hot bricks cooking it and they're turning it round and round and they do that just like in the streets i mean here you would never see anything like that just because of all the healthcare laws and, and things like that um so i mean that was something unique and different to see and to get used to at first i was hesitant to try the food try those street tacos but after i did i found out that they do taste pretty good i mean they actually taste really good i definitely recommend them you just have to you know make sure you're not eating from a dirtier place because there's some places that were just really really bad so that was kind of that was kind of cool and then another unique thing about mexico city too is um, they have tons of earthquakes some of them are more severe than others so i remember i got to experience probably about i don't know 12 or 12 to like 14 earthquakes some of them smaller some of them larger um, dur throughout the duration of my mission I remember the first one i didn't we lived in the apartment we lived in was at the intersection of two busy streets in mexico eje cinco and eje central so there was always constantly traffic at all or at all times of the day so our apartment would shake back and forth when a big semi passed so i kind of got used to that but i remember it was in the middle of the night and it was actually shaking really bad and so my companion was sick the night before so i didn't wake him up but he kind of got mad at me because i didn't afterwards i didn't wake him up because i didn't want to disturb him but it's like something's happening so i knew it was an earthquake so i was just kind of freaking out so then i told him about it in the morning he slept through and he's like why do you wake me up i'm like well i was, I was you know you didn't sleep or sick so he's like no you should have woken me up so that was something that i got used to experiencing the earthquakes and it's just kind of a, a weird feeling when your body goes just starts moving and it's just something you have to experience to really understand it kind of gives you a headache and things like that so that's something unique um and also one thing about mexico city is the reason for that is because it's it was built there used to be this huge lake before um i think it was called tenochtitlan i think i can't remember exactly the name of the lake but they drained the lake and then they built the city on there so the city's always sinking a little bit and so that's why there's all those earthquakes so that's something that you have to get used to in mexico city so it makes everything a little bit different and i mean there's tons and tons of traffic that's one thing that's different it's not as organized there they have traffic laws but people don't follow them and when people get in accidents like it just turns into the person gets out of their car and starts attacking the other person it's not as organized here because i mean here if you get in an accident you know exchange insurance information and then you pretty much never have to talk to that person again but there it's just almost doesn't happen just it's just so chaotic so one thing i actually really got used to the pace so i actually really like it because um, you can use there's a lot of things that you I mean they have the the one peso coin the two peso coin the five peso coin and the ten peso coin and things are down there are actually a lot cheaper just kind of give an idea I mean obviously the exchange rate fluctuates but um, one pay or uh, there's about 13 to 14 pesos in a dollar give or take and then and obviously it changes every once in a while um, and the cost of living it I mean it depends on the area because there's some areas of the the mission that were super nice where the cost of living was was fairly expensive even for just a one-bedroom apartment which is what the ones that we got but in other areas it was super cheap like I remember in my my second area in Reforma um, it was a actually it was a really crappy neighborhood to live in there's a lot of crime like we had a map of the neighborhood and then it's like this area you need to avoid after seven o'clock this area you need to avoid after six o'clock because some guy got stabbed here 
this time of day and some other guy got stabbed at this part of this this street so we'd avoid this whole area and that was like literally right next to where we lived um, so to live in that neighborhood it was actually really cheap like i remember we paid 2500 pesos for rent which is about 200 dollars. and so in that apartment we had it was a two bedroom apartment with a living room and then we also had a bathroom and in the bathroom there was a jacuzzi it was broken so we never used it but i mean we had that so it's a super nice apartment on the inside but the neighborhood itself was really really run down not very good and then in other areas that i'd been in we had to pay well i did exchanges here i never actually this wasn't my area but it wasn't called narvarte just in the northern part very northern part of the mission and there it's a closer to downtown so you ended up paying about like, you know, 5,000, 5,500 pesos for a tiny, tiny apartment of just one bedroom, a bathroom, and a tiny living space. So, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of varies just from um, each part of the mission. But, yeah, I mean, overall, it's, I'd say, I mean, you could definitely, it's definitely cheaper to live there um, than to live here. And, but, I mean, obviously, there's, there's parts where it's more expensive in the nicer neighborhoods. But on, on average, I would say it's, it's lower and it's a lot easier to to pay for things there and it's a lot more convenient to use the peso too i feel like just because i mean here with our coins and stuff with like a penny and a nickel and a quarter there's not really a lot that you can do with those unless you like get a bunch of them together and you can maybe use a quarter to get a gumball or something but but there if you have just a one peso like there's people in the subway lines that'll sell like pieces of the packs of gum or little chocolates for even for one peso so i mean you can literally use it and it's a lot more convenient because you, you know we work everything with the one the five and the ten and using the ten peso coins i mean and food's also a lot cheaper like they have a lot more little tiny tiny restaurants kind of like i mean they're less super less formal like there'll be just a kitchen next to someone's house and that'll be a little restaurant and you can buy yourself a really good meal for about 50 pesos like that's a you could easily get a nice meal, a nice like three or four course meal, which would be about for four dollars. Whereas you know here that you couldn't really do that with four dollars. I mean, it's a lot more expensive if you go to somewhere like Olive Garden. It's going to be a lot, and I mean, just they don't really have that option to get a nice four dollar meal here. I mean, you can get fast food, but it's not the same thing. So I mean, that's one thing that's definitely unique about you know the the cost of living down there. It's a lot more. I feel like it's a lot costs a lot less and it's there the, the money system there's pretty effective i feel like here in utah we have the grid system and other parts of the united states as well there in mexico they kind of do but not really so i mean you'll get streets that are in shapes like s's and streets that are shaped like c's and some in some places there's there's three streets that have like basically the same name and so it's really the one thing that's it's actually a miracle that we're able to find some some addresses because in some streets they'll literally be like the the three houses number 67s and just things like that so i mean it just it's really chaotic the way it's organized um, you can't really trust a grid, a grid system because randomly the numbers will start changing and they'll just they won't be in order so there's just not a lot of order in the, the way the streets are organized so I mean, it's really a miracle we would always joke around and say the only people you know that know the streets better than the missionaries are the the postal carriers because everyone else they don't know like then they know how to get to places but they don't know the name of the streets they take so that's one thing that too that's kind of different because here i mean you ask for directions people will tell you the street names but there if you ask for directions like oh we'll take a left and then at the at the, the tortilleria the tortilla store take a right things like that like they don't know the name of the streets themselves so that's one thing that's kind of interesting and then just using a taxi is kind of cool it's actually really convenient and it's, i mean here taxes are more expensive but down there they were really nice i really miss I, I there's a lot of times where i was like i wish i had a taxi to take me to you know back to my apartment or whatever so I mean, that's that's just kind of some other things and then let's see oh one thing too that i really like um here i mean we have the di which is kind of a cool store i like to shop there every once in a while but there they have uh, these things called tiangis and basically what they are is they're kind of like a garage sale but um, in larger sizes. So they'll just basically, they'll close down a whole street and there'll be vendors there that'll just have like a tarp. And on that tarp, they'll just put, you know, different things they're gonna sell. Like in some tiangis, you could find, you know, super nice cameras, you can find cell phones, you can find clothing, so you could find ties and things like that. Like we'd be able to find ties for like five pesos or three pesos even and things like that. So that's one thing that was really cool is because in the tiangis, like they would also sell food 
and they'd have crazy good deals. And that's one thing I also miss as well, the fresh fruit. Because there you can buy a mango and it's like, you know, three pesos or whatever. And you can buy bananas, they're super cheap. Um, but here, I mean, it's not fresh and it's more expensive. It's not as convenient because here we have a lot of preservatives and we sell a lot of canned foods, whereas there, they mostly have those tianguis and they, they buy the food like literally like two days before and then they use it up. So it's just kind of part of the culture. So they have those tianguis like once a week, usually there's in every single neighborhood, there's different tianguis. And so I think that was one of my favorite things walking through there and they'll have like free samples sometimes and just all sorts of things. And it's just a really cool experience to see all the things that people have for sale from clothing to, to food, to magazines, to movies, to even just DVD players and just everything, like anything you can imagine, they, they sell in the Tiangui. So that's kind of something kind of cool about Mexico City that I, wouldn't, I would think it would be kind of cool to see here sometime. So starting with the food, that's one thing that I actually am really passionate about. Um, so the way that a lot of the members remember me is because um, I was the missionary that always took a picture of the food. So I remember the first time my camera got stolen. After that, I lost a lot of pictures. And then, I mean, my family sent me a new camera. So I said, all right, I'm going to take more pictures. So I decided to take a picture every single day of the food that I ate. Like after the prayer, that'd be the first question I would ask the members. Because we ate with members every day, which was super nice. It was a nice blessing to be able to do that. So I'd always take a picture of their food. So food is just so good. Um, as far as the culture goes, that's one thing I admire the most. Like the, the way they use tortillas, the way they, they're able to cook, it's just so unique. I feel like the, some of the most talented cooks I ever met were down in Mexico. And some of the best food I've ever tried in my whole life was in Mexico. Like I'll have good food here, but it just, it just can't compare to the food that I tried down there. So I really, really admire them for their food, for what they're able to do with just a couple of chili peppers and some meat and what they're able to accomplish with tortillas. Another thing too that I really admire about Mexico is the, the really the importance of the family down there. I mean, that's one thing that it was really, that was really a good angle for us to use as missionaries, teaching about eternal families. Just because in here, one thing, I mean, kind of culturally, it's kind of like a kind of like a stereotype but not exactly the way I feel is like after you know your kids get to be 18 almost like you know like kick them, not kick them out of the house but everyone kind of moves out moves on their own whereas down there you'll get like I remember in some houses where we were teaching there'd be almost you know four generations you have the the you'd have like the little baby then she'd have her mother grandmother and the great grandmother and they would all be there still living in the same household so that was something that was really cool just the the way that the families stick together because down there in the in the mexican culture family is everything you know they have the the respect for family and everyone's a lot of people are related like you get in certain neighborhoods and people are like oh yeah he's my cousin and you know just that's one thing that i really admire about them i feel like in America, and, and this is not necessarily in, in Utah, I mean, our, we have a pretty good family culture as, as members of the church, but in America in general, it's kind of, I feel like, almost less focused on family. It's kind of everyone focused on your career and, you know, um, do whatever. But down there, that's something that I really admire about them culturally. Then also just, I mean, the way that they're able to uh, to live within their means, and that's something that, you know, you really I really admire about them because you see families that don't have a lot that are really happy like I teach families and you know all they have is maybe they have a basic TV or whatever and that's all that they you know they don't have a nice TV some of them don't even have internet some of them don't even have running water but yet they're still able to be happy and I feel like that's has to do a lot with the emphasis on the family so that's one thing that I really learned down there that you know the material things that we that we have they don't matter so much I mean yeah they're they're definitely nice to have like I mean having a hot shower in the morning it's really great but you know, you're, they're still able to be happy without those things. And so that's one thing I really admire about them is they're overall very happy, very warm culture. So, I mean, there in the streets, everyone says hi to everybody. Like you always walk around and you say, oh, buenos dias or buenas noches to everybody. And they would, they would say hi back and, you know, they'd start talking to you if you're on a bus or whatever. But here, I mean, I feel like as Americans in general, we're a little more cold, a little more kind of scared to interact with strangers. I mean, obviously that has a lot to do with, you know, whatever's been going on lately in, in the media and things like that. But but down there, they're, they're very forgiving. They're very trusting of a lot of people, of even of strangers. You know, they, they trust you and they're very accepting. Like a lot of people would let us teach them, even if it was just for one time, you know, they wouldn't really slam the doors on us. So that was really nice. I really admire them that about the culture. And I really miss that 
Because here I've never really felt that I could just, you know, walk down the street and say hi to everybody. I always feel like it'd be awkward. But down there, it's it's not awkward. You know, everyone's everyone's willing to talk to everybody. So that's, those are some things that I really admire about the culture. So the craziest thing I can think of, I mean, uh, there's two, the two times that I got robbed. Uh, the first time it was kind of crazy, but the second time I kind of want to share some more details just because it was actually kind of a life learning experience for me. But the first time um, we were walking the street, kind of once again in those crazy streets of Mexico, you can never find the right house. So we were going to teach someone that we contacted the other day. And I remember like we, there was this group of people off to the side on the left of the street. We we're on the right side. They were talking about, I don't know, I, I had been out for like three months. I didn't understand everything they were saying, but I'm pretty sure they were like making fun of us because they were laughing really loud and pointing at us. And so me and my companion were like, well, we're going to keep going. We didn't find the house we we're looking for. And we were trying to get to a busier street just because like, you know, we kind of started feeling a little uneasy. Um, and so right as we started feeling that, we were probably pretty close to the busy street, but this guy had like snuck up behind us, just like really quiet. We couldn't even hear him. And then just out of nowhere, just I remember just feeling this like kind of like, like a rock had hit me on the back of my head and I don't know if it was a rock or his hands I'm pretty sure it was his hands but that it felt like a rock so I remember that just kind of almost like knocked me out and then like at that time like if it wasn't for if I wasn't a missionary I would have like freaked out but I just you know I felt this it was weird because I kind of felt this like calm feeling it's like all right everything's gonna be okay just to grab your wallet give it to him and run kind of well not run but so it, that's all I did my companion didn't have anything lucky for us the guy was drunk and he was on drugs so I mean he couldn't really do much but so we pulled out the wallet threw it at him and luckily I only had like 11 pesos or 13 pesos and so then we walked away so that was kind of crazy and after that I was pretty scared at night and we pretty much avoided that street for the rest of my time in the area so that was kind of scary I'd never know if that guy had a gun on him or not but and so that was that was one thing that was crazy the second time though it was actually a little bit crazier because we were in my it's my third area of Contreras in the mountain area and I was training a brand new missionary and he was really struggling with with Spanish just as every new missionary does and with you know with the culture being away from home and things like that so I remember that we went to because a member had given us money to go buy food for that day so we go to buy food the, the money that the member had given us was fake so that was kind of frustrating so we had to use our own money and so then we get back to the apartment and we because we wanted to compare that fake bill to a real bill so we're trying to find our real money and we couldn't find any and then my companion's like oh my money's all gone so then check and i was like oh wait my money's all gone oh my camera's gone everything's gone so we found out that we'd been robbed and so then we check the window and we see that the latch it's broken like it wasn't like a broken window but he like cleverly you know broken the latch or whatever and the other thing that we found out too is because i had my american money hidden away in my suitcase which is under my bed inside of like an old shoe or something but he had been able to find that so we realized that someone had been watching us for the past you know however long couple weeks because they would have had to have known that we leave every day at 12 and come back at 9 because they had tons of time to search the house and I mean it's kind of I don't know kind of crazy everything that was going on but I remember we like called the mission president he's like all right well I need you to check the house to see if anyone was still hiding in there so we look inside the bathroom and just under the cupboards and just my companion starting to freak out because he's a new missionary he's like why is this happening to me I can't I can't handle this like I need to go home things like that and so I mean I was first I was frustrated then I was scared but then I realized no I can't I can't feel any of those emotions because if I do my companion's gonna feed off of that and he's gonna freak out so I decided, all right, well, you know what? I'm going to pretend that everything's okay. And so I did that. And then it actually kind of helped me to learn in life that, you know, there's crazy things that happen, but they're going to happen whether we feel good about it or not. So it's like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just whatever, just kind of live life, try to comfort my, my companion, make sure he's okay. I don't care about my money, my pictures, my camera, that's fine. And so then it gets even crazier because the next day we, we had to go meet the president to go get money because we didn't have any money. So he gave us money and we took a, um, a bus back and then we get to our street and we're walking back. And then there was this guy in a taxi that had been like almost following us, gets out of the taxi, he has this wooden bat in his hand and he just starts like doing this slowly. He's like, I just want to talk to you guys. I just want to talk to you guys. And my companion's like, oh, no, not again. So my companion starts running. So then I start running, and we run into the house. And remember, we, we hear this guy chasing us. And this is the day after we'd just been robbed. So then we call the mission president. And he's like, all right, what? so what should we do? We're like, well, we don't really want to sleep in our apartment tonight because, you know, we don't feel comfortable. They've obviously been watching us. They know everything. So we ended up sleeping in a different apartment with other missionaries that night. But it was just kind of crazy. And, I mean, 
the way that like how we lost everything but one thing that i learned from that experience was you know i mean because at that time i could have decided to freak out and you know like curl up and cry and everything and scream and you know get frustrated but i decided not to do that because if i did that then my companion who was just barely starting his mission out would have you know it would have impacted him a lot and you know who knows what would have happened so that was one thing that i was able to learn from that experience just you know everything and to this day i've had like, you know, car trouble or other things like that. And I've just been able to say, all right, well, it's going to happen, but everything's going to be okay. It was okay back then. It'll be okay now. And so it's kind of been something that I actually, I mean, I don't want to say I'm grateful for it, but, you know, kind of am just because I learned a lot from him. We ended up losing a lot of stuff. Me and, me and my companion combined and whatever was stolen. He lost his iPod and his music speakers. And then I lost all my money together. We lost like 2000 pesos worth of stuff. It was about like almost $200. I mean, it's quite a lot, especially for a missionary. But so it was, it was, yeah, it was a pretty good learning experience. I think seeing like um, people bleeding on the street, I don't know if that counts, but I mean, you'd see people like that a lot. Um, and then just hearing gunshots um, and things like that. And then I remember I was kind of in one of my other areas, we were teaching this drunk guy and working with drunk people can be kind of scary sometimes too. But I guess there was this drunk guy and I was out for like two weeks. So I didn't understand it, anything. My companion told me about it later, but he was like a, apparently a sniper for like the Mexican government. Like he had killed like hundreds of people. And so he was talking to us and then we, we didn't feel very comfortable. So we were trying to leave. But I remember like the guy just stood up and like slammed his fist on the ground. He's like, no, you guys will not leave until I finish telling you what I have to say. I listen to you guys. Now you guys are going to listen to me. And so I was just like, I was dazed off, but that, so that's what really woke me up. Cause I was almost falling asleep cause I just was bored, I guess. But, and so then luckily someone else came in and like started talking to the guy and the guy had already shown us like his pictures of all these, you know, all these crazy helicopters and government stuff. So we knew he wasn't lying. So this other guy came in and then we, we got out. And so we we're, we we're glad that other guy came in cause we didn't know if we would have been able to leave or what this guy was going to do to us. And so that was kind of scary. And that was when, that was when I was been a missionary for like three weeks. So it was pretty intense. Kind of like what, I mean, what you'd picture from like seeing the, the Good Samaritan story, like you just, you'd see people just bleeding in the street and things like that. And sometimes, I mean, they were, I mean, half the time, I wonder if they were just drunk and they just fell down because they were so drunk, maybe bang their head or something. But yeah, just um, crazy things like that would happen where, you know, every time you, you'd walk in the street, they'd have the newspapers on every street corner and all the headlines. It's actually kind of different because, I mean, our media, their media, their media just shows everything. Like there's just like people with their heads chopped and just all these bloody pictures and scary things. So I don't know if earthquake counts as weather, but... So that's kind of extreme. But the other thing is, I remember this one day, it was just raining so much. And I was in, in this area called Contreras. Like it would rain so much that we would try to go, we had to go up a hill and we couldn't make it up the hill very well because it was just raining so much. And my shoes, I had these blue insoles on under my shoes. And I remember like everything was just soaking wet just from all the rain and it was starting to get painful. So I get home to the apartment and take my shoes off and my feet are completely blue just because there, there was so much water and it just plus a little bit of frostbite kind of going on because it was a little cold. So I think that that day was pretty bad in that, in that area in Contreras because it was just so rainy and though the streets were flooded like the cars could barely drive like they were kind of swerving around just because it was like literally trying to drive through a river and just because the drainage system wasn't very good and you know we were at the top of the hill so everything goes down from where we were into the the valley of the city so I mean that was probably the most extreme weather that I had to deal with just some insane crazy rainstorms and you'd see like dead cats floating around and just crazy things like that one thing I learned to do is I learned how to take a shower with um, two liters of water. I mean, that's pretty talented. I mean, I don't do that anymore, but I also learned how to wash wash clothes by hand. So that was pretty good. And then I learned how to live within my means. That's so we, we wouldn't have a lot as missionaries, so we learned how to budget. Um, and I learned how to enjoy the simple things in life. And yeah, just I learned how to overall be happy no matter what. I think probably would be the most significant skills that I learned on my mission.
And there's always the the general example. I'm I'm pretty sure I've heard this once, whether I said it myself or heard it within another missionary. But I mean, in Spanish, you can say like I'm embarrassed, which you really would want to say like oh, estoy avergonzado. But a lot of times people say estoy embarazado, which would mean like I'm pregnant, which you know doesn't really work. So I mean, I've heard that I've heard that a couple times, and I can't remember if I said it myself. But I mean, just little things like that. Um, I think, or some like sometimes those cognates where you try to translate the word from English into Spanish, and it's a completely different thing. Just little things like that um, will probably be the the language mistakes that I've seen. I had horse once. Didn't know it was horse while I was eating it. I've had cow stomach. I've had um, cow brain. I've had pretty much every part of a pig. So I mean, I think that those are kind of the most unique things, I guess. You don't eat cow stomach every day, or you know, horse meat. I was kind of shocked when I found out it was horse meat but I would say that those are probably the most exotic things I ate everything else was pretty good definitely bringing a coat just because I mean you don't need a snow coat but a nice rain jacket because it does rain a lot it does get cold so having kind of like warmer clothing like even long sleeve shirts and and a suit coat is really nice to have because it does get pretty cold and that would be probably the biggest thing I would suggest you know getting good shoes especially as a missionary because in my mission there's no cars it's an all walking mission and so having good shoes that are able to endure water because if you can't endure the water then you're not going to last very long during the rainy season so that's that's what I would suggest more than anything getting having a warm coat and some good waterproof clothing and shoes lots of extra socks one of the greatest life lessons I've learned I learned was you know the gospel changes people because I look at myself before my mission and after my mission and the way I see it is there's almost like, I mean, I can't even remember how I used to be as a person. I mean, I still have some of the same hobbies, but um, the gospel really can change people because I've, I've seen people that were, you know, drunk, drug addicts that were involved in some crazy bad things and just being able to see them do a complete turnaround in their life has been significant and being able to see the power of what the gospel's done in my life um, has been a really, really significant thing. So I think that that's definitely the, the biggest life lesson that I learned, and also the power of, of faith and believing. Because I mean, what a mission is all about is miracles. And even if the miracles are really small, like that's one thing too you learn is to learn to recognize the small things in life. Because like for for a lot of times we don't think of things that are miracles, but really they are. Like the fact that someone accepts us to listen to the gospel that's that's a huge that's a miracle. And the fact that someone reads their scriptures and comes to church, that's a miracle. So, I mean, our lives as members, a lot of times we take for granted, you know, like the fact that we can partake of the sacrament, you know, that, that really is a miracle that we're able to, you know, be forgiven for our sins and like, have them erased. That's, that's a pretty, pretty significant miracle. So I think, I think learning to recognize those little miracles that, you know, they're, they're everywhere, even if, you know, they're maybe not as big as what we were expect, expecting, but you know, just the blessings and the miracles are everywhere. So I think, and also one thing I also learned too is the value of studying the scriptures and the power that they have. Um, just because, I mean, in the mission, I remember because I was, I was a district and zone leader, and so um, we would we'd have to like counsel with the missionaries, interview them, and you know, re do reports with them, see what they're doing. So what we would do is we would use the scriptures as a teaching tool. And just to be able to see how, you know, we could literally substitute their name in a verse and their area or one of their investigators in a verse and be able to see how it applies to their life so perfect was just amazing to me. Even just still today, that's something that I see in my life with the scriptures, you know, how how they really applied to us. Because before my mission, you know, you hear the scripture mastery songs, you go to seminary, but it doesn't, it didn't really, I guess, what's the way to say it, it didn't really, um, it didn't really come alive for me until I was on my mission, seeing it in other people, how the scriptures applied directly to them and how scriptures would just pop in your head when you're in the middle of a lesson that you, you know, you hadn't read for three months, but all of a sudden you remember it clear as day. Just things like that, um, I'd say were probably the best life skills I learned on my mission. So one of the most spiritual experiences I had, I think, was on my mission as I was a new missionary getting ready, learning the language. I remember one day my companion was with me and, you know, we were catching a bus to go back to our apartment and he told me all right you need to contact the entire bus I was like I, I don't speak Spanish well enough to do that I can't do that that's not happening it's like no you should do it and I was gonna tell him no way but then I had this feeling that you know maybe I should do it you know it's it won't do any bad so I decided to do it 
contact the entire bus and I remember I don't remember exactly what I said and I just in my broken Spanish I think I said you know something to the effect of we are missionaries of the church we have the the gospel and it's been restored and I remember we went around asking everyone in the bus if they wanted to listen and everyone said no except for one person and the one person that said yes was was Carlos and I remember the first time we talked Carlos we asked him well you know why did you decide to listen to us and he said well there was one thing that you said that really caught my attention I was like well what, what did we say and he's like well you said you have the restored gospel and then he told us that his whole life he'd been you know kind of studying the word gospel and, and which in Spanish is evangelio he wanted to know what does it mean where did it come from and things like that and so he'd done a lot of research and just the fact that we had found we had phrased the presentation in exactly the right way specifically for him it's really a miracle for me to be able and be able to see him progressing and how quickly he accepted the gospel and was able to get baptized it was really a miracle and, and another miracle another cool experience that I had was in my uh, my second area we were teaching this um, investigator named named Juana and she had a, a store where she sold you know like uh, food and and everything like that and usually the biggest sale day was on Sunday um, but we we taught her about the the Sabbath day and she she was like, well, I don't know what I can do if I can, you know, close my store. But she ended up, she decided to close her store Sunday. And she told us about the experience that she had because she said, um, you know, when I close the store Sunday, um, the Saturday before that, I actually sold more than I'd ever sold before. And my, my customers, they came to me, the ones that usually come on Sunday, and they were talking to her. And um, they were like, why'd you close on Sunday? So then she said, well... You know, I, I mean, she mentioned that she was listening to missionaries and things like that. But she also said, well, I, I just feel like, you know, it's better to prepare yourself on Saturday for Sunday. So get everything you need Saturday so that Sunday you don't need to do it. And then all her customers were like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So they were all able to do that as well. And that was really cool to see how quick she was able to progress and to be able to demonstrate, you know, what the the Sabbath day is as far as sharing her testimony about it and being able to see her progress that was pretty awesome another thing too that was really cool for me was to be able to see how how God answers prayers I remember there was a family we were teaching um, in my it was my fourth area in East of Calico so we were teaching this family they were less active so there was only one name on the list and we found the name and we, we went to teach them and um, so his name was, um, the family was the family Cortez, the Cortez family. So we're teaching the family and the wife, she said that um, she literally had been praying a week ago. Um, she was, ironically, she was in like the, the Catholic church in a different church praying for guidance, you know, what to do with her life. And so we came in and they literally just seemed so excited, so ready to hear us. And we were able to teach and we found out that, you know, she that they had two daughters and that the daughters hadn't been baptized. So we were able to teach them and uh, they were able to get baptized fairly quickly. And it was just really cool how quickly they were able to accept the gospel and how we were able to see that change in that family and how, you know, they literally had been praying a week ago because the, the less actors, you know, they had left the church for whatever reason and they didn't know how to come back. Um, but the fact that we were able to help them find the way to come back was really just a, a big miracle to me. It was a really spiritual experience. Another spiritual, excuse me, another spiritual experience that I was able to have was in my second to last area. Um, we were teaching this investigator, and he had a lot of changes that he needed to make. Um, you know, his name was Carlos. He had a lot of things he needed to change. He needed to stop drinking. Um, he needed to change his lifestyle a little bit, and we were able to to see him change. It was a long process. I remember the first time we taught him, um, you know, we got him ready for baptism, and then I remember the day before his baptism, he'd already passed his interview, already, you know, made all the changes necessary, but I remember we talked to him the day before baptism, we teach him, and then we go home, and then the day of his baptism, we go to pick him up, and we notice something's wrong, you know. He wasn't there. Um, well, he said that he wasn't there, but he actually was, and then we came back later, and we found out that he had, you know, he had collapse he went and drank the night before his baptism so that was kind of hard um, but this really taught me the importance of uh, persevering and we continued to teach him and so even after he'd, he had you know failed um, he decided to keep listening and six weeks later we were able to work with him even harder and we were able to get him to be baptized and for me that was just a really spiritual experience because it was even harder for him the second time because you know we were seeing how the adversary was working against him but to be able to see Carlos and his growth to see him change and to be able to see him receive the 
the priesthood and, and pass the sacrament after his baptism was really cool for me just because you know with all that we'd been through we've been teaching him for about six to eight months working with him and it was tough because he had a lot of addictions that he had to leave behind but being able to see that to see him change was a, a big miracle for me so and well i just want to say that you received your mission call to la mejor mission del mundo the best mission of the world it's a great mission um it definitely changed my life for the better and i'm grateful for my mission president for the experience i was able to have so it was amazing i was able to see how almost each and every investigator was almost specifically tailored toward me to help me to be able to progress to learn from them so i know that it's a very special place you know, the church is very strong down there you'll definitely be able to have a life-changing experience almost every day if you let if you let the spirit uh, influence you to change and that way it's there's so many great people down there to teach a lot of things to learn um, definitely you know a great experience it's one of the the best places to be in the world the food is great the spirit's stronger um, it's a it's a great place to be it's a great mission you'll enjoy it it'll change your life uh, remember that God called you there for a reason you just need to find those people that are waiting specifically for you and I know that you'll be able to do that because I was able to do that and I didn't think that I would be able to find anyone that was waiting specifically for me but i was amazed to see how there were people that were waiting specifically for me and i know that you'll be able to do the same